Good morning. It's true. It's all true. Christ is risen. That's the only thing that needs to be said today. We have a short message. No. In some ways, it's the only thing that can be said. If anything proves the kingship of Jesus Christ, it is his resurrection from the dead. The final chapter of Matthew is a record of victory. This morning, we're looking into Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 to 10. This morning, as we look and dive into the Easter story and Christ's victory over the grave, I want us to focus on the women who came seeking Jesus early that first Easter morning. All four gospel writers share about the women who came to the tomb. And there's a reason for it. And I believe this will give us encouragement in our own walks of faith and, and in following and seeking the Lord. So if you have your Bibles with you, I encourage you to bring yours. If you don't, there's some at the back. You can turn with me to Matthew chapter 28, and I'm going to read here the verse 10 verses, and then I'll open in a word of prayer. Matthew chapter 28, verse 1 says this, Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen. As he said, Come, see the place where he lay. They go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you in Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell that his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go, tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Let's open in a word of prayer here this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the victory that is ours in Christ. Help us to live a life victorious, over sin, over selfishness, and over failure. Father, I ask this not in my life or our life, that it will be easy, but so that we will be glorified, or that you will be glorified, and Jesus will be known as Lord through my, our hearts and actions. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Fear is not an, a usual emotion associated with Easter Sunday. Excitement, yes. Enthusiasm among the people of God, absolutely. Exhaustion for parents from hiding eggs, more likely. And yet the last two Easter's have had us fearing not for the earth-shaking appearance of the angel and God's sovereignty, but of our comfort levels and life itself. Fear of God is always connected with the assurance that God cares for us. For example, Luke chapter 12, verse 32 says, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. 1 Peter 3, verses 14 to 15 says, Even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ, the Lord, as holy. That's why we're here this morning, every day, 
And in particular, Easter Sunday is a time for celebration. The stranglehold of death has been broken. Some 2,000 years ago, two women were by a tomb early in the morning. These women were seeking Jesus. They were seeking him with all their hearts, and they were not disappointed. For in finding Jesus, they found all that they hoped for and more. The question we need to ask is, what are we hoping to find through our relationship with Christ? We read in verse 1 that states, Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. In Matthew's account here, he speaks of the two Marys, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. These were two women who traveled with Jesus and the disciples and, and helped and tended to their needs. Throughout his earthly ministry, that we've been following in our series through the Gospel of Mark, Matthew tells us that these two women set off to Jesus' tomb after the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week. And the Sabbath officially ended with sundown on Saturday. At that time, the women could prepare and purchase spices to anoint Jesus' body. We see that found in Luke chapter 24, verse 1. So this could have occurred on Sunday morning, or would have occurred. That being the first day of the week. This was the dawning not only of a new day, but of a new covenant, a new celebration of the new covenant, which would no longer be as Spurgeon said at the end of the week of work, but at the beginning of a new era. And that is why we meet here on Sunday mornings, not on the Sabbath, Saturday. And so at the dawning of the third day, the day of resurrection, with that time for reference, we now join the women in the story. They have left while it's still dark in order to arrive at the tomb at the first light of day. Like many of us and you have before gotten up early to go to work. These women put Jesus first. They stayed after Jesus was taken down from the cross and watched Joseph of Arimaeus wrap the body and place it in a tomb. Nothing could be more pressing, more important, more precious than seeking Jesus, even after his death. Their first motion is an emotion, is a motion of sympathy. Well, we can identify with that. They love Jesus. They ministered with Jesus in Galilee. They attended his needs. They provided food, hospitality, and even money and resources for him during his ministry. Nothing seems to separate them. The testimony of these women thus became a model for the disciples who will eventually follow them. And we see that found in Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 to 20. And yet with the 12 disciples... They're not expecting what is yet to come. So here we have a couple of women in the dark. They love the Lord in sympathy and yet not looking for the resurrected Lord. As many times as Jesus talked about the resurrection, as many times as he had promised the resurrection, their faith could not handle it. They, like the disciples, did not accept it. They couldn't understand it. They did not believe it. So why are they there? Well, we saw in verse 1 that they came to see the grave, not the risen Lord, but to anoint his body. I'm sure they would have had discussions on the way and how to get the stone out of the way so they could do what they needed to do. They did not do, know that it was going to be guarded by a Romans or that it was sealed. They came with sympathy. And what they lacked in faith, they made up for in compassion. 
And what they lacked in understanding, they made up for in courage to identify themselves with Christ. And before we think too little of these women who came without faith in one sense, we must ask ourselves, where were the disciples at? Well, they were hiding, cowarding, and at least the women were there. Whatever their motive, it was one last final act of love. The disciples were nowhere to be found. Often we don't seek Jesus as we should because we run into obstacles. Perhaps we have a busy schedule or some burden that we are bearing or some difficulty that we are facing. Whatever the obstacles, when it comes to seeking Christ, we should let nothing stand in our way. The women who came to Jesus' tomb that first Easter morning had their share of obstacles. The guards, the Jewish leaders obtained permission from Pilate to post guards at the tomb. And they said in this case, in case the disciples tried to steal the body and pretended that Jesus had risen from the dead. And secondly, there was the stone itself. Jesus' tomb was cut out of rock, and the entrance would have been sealed by a large stone, which most likely needed more than two to remove. And so these women had some physical obstacles that stood in their way. And if that wasn't enough, let's take a look at verses 2 to 4. And it says, Behold, there was a great earthquake, earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. There's that word fear again. The initial cause of fear in the text was the earth-shaking appearance of the angel. It was as if lightning had descended from heaven in a, in a bodily form, rolled away the storm, perched itself on the rock victoriously. The earthquake ensured that any claim made later that the guards were asleep could not be true. Second, it was also how God broke Rome's seal. No matter how great and glorious man's power seems to himself, it's nothing before God's power. God broke the seal because Rome's power, as in with all human power, is in, in Consequential, consequential to God. Rome needed to be fearful of God. Why did the angel roll the stone away? Not to let Jesus out, but to let the women and the disciples in. The soldiers were stuck, struck with divine fear because they could not, because they could see the angel. So much so that they fainted and fell unconscious like dead men. How do we know these things happen? Well, either God revealed it directly to Matthew, who is the only one who records it, or one of the guards who told Matthew later. Verse 5, the angel speaks of the women. Here we have fear followed by the assurance from God again. Do not be afraid. For I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. Do not be afraid. You notice the angel never said anything to the guards. The angel let the guards hit the ground. And so why does the angel speak these words of reassur reassur reassurance sorry, to the women? Well, he said, for I know that you are looking for Jesus. The word translated looking for is a word that means to seek. These women did not need to be afraid because they had come seeking Jesus. The question we need to ask ourselves is, have we come seeking Jesus this morning? Then we don't need to be afraid either. Hebrews 1.14 says, 
Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? If you're seeking Jesus, then God is on your side. And God's angels are on your side too. The angel identifies Jesus as the one who was crucified. You are seeking Jesus who was crucified. These women didn't come looking for Jesus the risen Christ. They were looking for Jesus the crucified. They brought spices and perfumes to anoint his dead body. They didn't understand all they needed to know about Jesus, but they were seeking him nonetheless. In your Christian walk right now, you may not understand everything about Jesus that you would like to either, and that's okay. It's enough that you are seeking him, looking for answers, reading and learning from his word. And to these seekers of Jesus, the angel brings the glad proclamation in verse 6, with Matt, which Matthew, Mark, Luke all record in some form. He is not here. He is risen. Just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. He is risen. Just as he said. But there might be a... a just a hint of a gentle rebuke in these words. Just as he said, or at least a reminder. Jesus had conquered death. And by that proved that both the claims he had made about himself and his promises were true. God's grace was poured out on mankind in a new and powerful way. But at this moment, it doesn't matter anymore. The angel extends his word of grace to the women Jesus has risen from the dead. Come and see the place where he lay. The women look and see that Jesus' body is no longer there. They have come seeking Jesus at the tomb. The tomb is empty. Christ has risen indeed. Let me ask you this morning. What obstacles are in your way of seeking Jesus Christ this morning? Is a lack of faith. Then ask God to give you the faith that you need. Is it some sin in your life? Jesus died to forgive your sin. Don't let sin stand in the way of seeking Jesus. Is it pride? James 4.10 says, Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Is it some heavy burden? that you are carrying. 1 Peter 5, verse 7 says, Cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Trust God to roll away the storm. Look at verse 7. Now where the angel continues to address the women, he says, Go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you in Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. The angel tells them to go tell the disciples that Jesus is alive and is going ahead of them into Galilee. Back in Matthew 26, Jesus had told his disciples that after I've risen, I will go ahead of you in Galilee. And now the angel instructs the women to remind the disciples of Jesus of Jesus' previous words. The disciples will have their own opportunity to seek Jesus in Galilee. The angel ends by saying, Now I have told you. The angel has just discharged his responsibility. He's testifying of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now the women are responsible to testify. They've been instructed by God through the angel to go and tell the disciples quickly and without any delay. And the same command applies to us today. Each person who receives the good news of Jesus' resurrection has an obligation to pass it on to others. It's almost as if, though when we have finished sharing the gospel with someone else, that we can say with the angel, there, I have told you, now it is your turn. What did the women do? Well, look at verse 8. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. The angel told them to go quickly. 
The women obeyed joyfully. They hurried away and ran to tell the disciples they were afraid. Who wouldn't be after facing that angel? And yet they were filled with great joy. Matthew does something very interesting at this point in his narrative here. And that is, and it's hard to pick up in most translations. He writes that they hurried away from the tomb. That word tomb back in verse 1 meant a grave or a burial place. Well, here Matthew uses a different word for tomb. Here in verse 8, the word tomb in verse 1 came from a word meaning to bury. The word tomb here in verse 8 comes from a word meaning to remember. In this word, it is a word for monument or memorial. Why the difference? The women came looking for a place where Jesus was buried. But he is no longer buried there. He is risen from the dead. And so the tomb is no longer a grave, but simply a memorial, a reminder of the place where Jesus' body lay, buried from Good Friday evening to Sunday Easter morning. The tomb was empty. And so the women hurried away from the memorial, and they ran to tell the disciples. And as they run in joyful obedience to spread the good news, Jesus himself meets them. Look at verse 9. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. They had come seeking Jesus, and at last they found him. The Lord whom they loved, whom they served during his earthly ministry, whom they had seen crucified, dead, Buried now stands before them as they fall at his feet in loving worship. Jesus addresses them in verse 10, and it would be awesome enough to have an angel to speak to you, but now they have the risen Christ himself speaking to them. Verse 10 says, Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Jesus speaks the same words as the angel, except for one small difference. Notice that Jesus here addresses his disciples as my brothers. What a wonderful kingship we have that we can share with our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Well, Hebrews chapter 2 verse 11 tells us that Jesus is not ashamed to call us his brothers and his sisters. And once again, these are wonderful words of grace coming from the lips of Jesus. The disciples had quarreled together. They had been slow to believe. They had deserted Christ. They had huddled in fear, hiding from the Jews and the Romans. They had not come seeking Jesus as the women did. And yet Jesus still calls them my brothers. What a wonderful Savior Jesus is. The women who came seeking Jesus that first Easter morning became the very first eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Christ. What a wonderful experience that must have been. Why is that? Because they were there. If you're not there, you're not going to see it. Profound, right? <laughs> Similar to being involved in Christ's ministry today. If you're not there serving, learning, you're missing out. I think of a humorous story from Acts chapter 20, verses 7 to 12, involving Paul. It's humorous in my mind because many of us can identify with the slow drift into sleep during a lecture or a film or, let's be honest, a sermon. I love the realism of this story. It reveals some important timeless principles and priorities for corporate worship. This day has been set apart by the Lord's resurrection as the Lord's day. Every Sunday, in a sense, is Easter Sunday for Christians. We gather to remind ourselves of the glorious fact that the tomb is empty and the throne is occupied. We remind ourselves of the living hope in our living Savior. Like the women at the tomb. Or that particular congregation in Troas, when we meet together for worship, teaching, service, we never know what might happen. Someone may pull back a stone, or someone may fall out a window, 
and be brought back to life. What a bummer to miss those events as believers because we weren't there. Today, it doesn't have to be some extraordinary experience every Sunday, every Sunday to justify making a regular part of your life. But our habits shape us. I trust that we will strive to be like those women in our passage here this morning. What we may lack in faith, we make up for in devotion. What we may lack in understanding, we make up for in loyalty. And God will confirm your weaknesses and turn it into strength. Because you're faithful enough, you're loyal enough, to be where he is and where he is moving and where he is working. You'll never be dis disappointed when you're seeking Jesus first. Because when you seek him, you'll find him. And he's all that you'll ever want or need. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what an astonishing lesson to learn from the wonderful story of the resurrection where the tears of the women and the doubts of Christ's disciples caused them to forget the truths of your word and the glorious gospel of Christ, his sacrifice for sin and his victory over death. And I pray that we would not allow the emotions of our hearts and the imaginations of our minds or difficulties of life circumstances to eclipse the truth of your word. May we stand on the truths of Scripture, obey your commands, trust your promises, and never forget that your word is steadfast, sure, living, powerful, sharper than any double edged sword, and cannot be broken. Father, may we seek you. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.